time here, because if I move, which is what I normally do, I will go way over half an hour. So <laughs> just stand still and speak to the script, and hopefully I'll keep within the half an hour. So for those of you that don't know me, I'm Alice Mangello. Um, my role here at UHI is the program leader for the BA Childhood Practice, the HMC Childhood Practice, and also the new Graduate Apprenticeship in Early Learning and Childcare. So I really do that much. <laughs> anyway, that's a program leader across the whole of UHI. So that basically involves me managing or leading 10 academic partners under those three programs. So it's quite a big undertaking, but they all connect and it makes sense for me to have that overview perspective. It's a real delight for me to be here because I actually don't often speak about early learning and childcare anymore because these are my roots. My roots are in early learning and childcare. I've been in early learning and childcare for the past 30 years, which is giving a little bit of my age away. Um, and I began as an EYP. I began as an EYP and worked for seven years as an EYP. I wouldn't be able to do that now because I'm not qualified as an EYP. I came from a very academic route, um, but I fell into working with children. Actually, it was either going to be a vet or work to children. And I decided that children was the thing for me. So um, it's a delight for me to be able to speak about it because in what, I, what I speak about now most of the time is my doctoral research, which is adult education. So now I get to go back to early learning and childcare. Um, what, what I want to suggest to you is that while we often speak about innovative and creative ideas and ways of working. What I want to suggest to you is that nothing is innovative or creative that actually comes out in relation to early learning and childcare. That any of the foundation that we speak about now was introduced in the 1800s. So this idea of love, this idea of outdoor play, this idea of parental engagement, this idea of loose parts play, that was all developed in the 1800s. Early learning and childcare is a pendulum, and a pendulum that swings back and forth in relation to what is deemed as good practice and high quality and what is not, and then it goes back again, and it goes back again. So I'm hoping that in the presentation that I'm going to give to you today that you're going to get a sense of the journey that we've taken in early learning and childcare and really how little has changed in the sector in the 30 years that I've been involved in it. I've talked about it as a master, mastering the art of juggling because mastering the art of juggling requires quite a lot of technique that I do not have <laughs> at all. Um, and I think that there's a number of quality indicators that I suggest make up high quality um, provision. And you have to juggle these all the time. Um, and as you can see, I can't do that at all. And often what we will forget is because I'm saying to you that a lot of what has been discussed and described today um, is seen as new and innovative, really maybe what you want to research is Frubel's work. And Frubel, you will see that in the 1800s, he speaks about and promotes most of the practices that are being developed today. And he is often known as the unacknowledged founder of child-centeredness. Child-centeredness, that concept that's said by many and understood by few, um, which is what we're trying to work towards when we're working with them in early learning childcare. So what I get to be is I get to be the academic today. So what I'm going to do in my role as the academic is I'm going to pose to you thought-provoking questions and play the elephant in the room game. So I want to say maybe what could be considered as controversial because that's what academics get to do. Um, so we've spoken a lot today about the funding going with the child. How many of you remember in the 1990s, what was introduced in early learning and child care, which was based on exactly the same principles as funding goes with the child. Any of you remember what came into being in the 1990s? Voucher scheme. So the voucher scheme came into being in the 1990s, and I'll read you from a document that was published in the 1990s, which could be actually published today. And it says, Places will be of a high quality, 
and cost effective. They should reflect parental preferences and should not crowd, crowd out the private or voluntary sectors. Voluntary sectors is now referred to as the third sector. The ultimate aim is to contribute to improved educational attainment later in school. Does that sound familiar? So that was published by the Scottish office at that time in relation to early learning and childcare. Vouchers were piloted, they were not successful. They didn't work. But what they did do to early learning and childcare is they opened up the realm of marketization and private nurseries increased in 10 years by over 300% in 10 years, between 1980 to 1980, uh, sorry, 1980 to 1991, that's what the sector increased, because there was a demand for it. So I want you to consider and ponder on a few things. Who decided that 11 and 40 hours was beneficial? Who actually made that decision? Were children asked that that's what they wanted? Were parents asked, was that what they wanted? How can we be offering an element of flexibility when really there is no option to use your 1140 hours by sending your child to early learning or childcare? What if I'm the mother that chooses to be at home with my children? Who's paying me? to do that, because I choose not to use the 1140 hours entitlement. I'm not saying these are my perspectives, I'm just being the devil's advocate here. How can early learning and childcare address the attainment gap that's linked with poverty? How can it make that difference? Is this an idea of a plastering philosophy? That we have a significant issue cultural, social issue, and we can fix that wound with a plaster by providing more early learning and childcare? If early learning and childcare is so vital, why is the pay and conditions for the majority of staff that work in that sector not equatable to other professions, teaching, social work? Why is it that it's still paid less? And I totally understand about the real living wage. That's not enough. I would argue that that's not enough for the job that they are doing. It is so vital and it's so important. When I first started in early learning and childcare, I got paid two fifty an hour for the job. And there was some talk about fair working. The Scottish government spoke about fair working principles. I did the job because I was committed to it for the children and the families. So when you look at the principles of fair working, many of those I'm totally on board with. But what about the salary and the conditions for the staff? What messages are being sent to parents and families in terms of your child is eligible for a place at the age of two? Now remember, Initially, that was called vulnerable two-year-olds. And they quickly realized that's not okay. What message does that send? You can't care for your children. Your children are vulnerable. We need to take them away from you and give early learning and childcare. So they change vulnerable to eligible. Are we sending indirect messages to children's families in terms of you are not capable of caring for your children and therefore we need to take them away from you to provide what they need to lessen that attainment gap. You following my thinking? Remember, I'm not saying these are my perspectives, I'm just being the devil's advocate here. Is it really provider neutral? Is funding going with the child really provider neutral when we're seeing in the central belt that third sector and private sector nurseries are shutting? Because now the local authority who's more able to pay a higher salary to their staff are taking children away from the private and the third sector. So these are just 
questions that I want you to think about, to ponder on. Is this an economically driven principle, philosophy, policy? What's the driving message behind the expansion in early learning and childcare? So when we look at quality provision, another concept that you can think of is you can think of it like the pieces of a jigsaw. And all the pieces in the jigsaw, like the juggling of the balls, they all need to fit together. And I've identified what I would consider to be several of the contributing pieces to the jigsaw. And actually, although I've got the child at the bottom, the child should be at the top. <laughs> because the child is the most important aspect in terms of considering quality. So the four aspects that I've identified as these significant pieces is the curriculum, the parents, the community, the resources. I think it's really important when you think of the resources because you're looking at the resources that are physical, as in the resources indoors, the resources outdoors, the space, the environment, and they're also human. And human adds these layers of complexities because you're also thinking about the relationships. And then you have the qualifications and training. Now we've said, we've spoken about high quality provision all the way through this afternoon, and I think it's quite an elusive concept. What does it look like? Can we see it? Can we measure it? These are all ideas that we should be thinking about when we're considering quality provision. So the changing landscape, what does it mean for early learning and childcare? I've specifically chosen this picture because I think early learning and childcare can be represented by the mountains. So all of the concepts around what I would consider as a really good high quality level of early learning and childcare remains unchanged. Outdoor play, love, the importance of parental engagement, loose parts play, this is nothing new that we're saying. It remains unchanged, but what does change is the landscape around us, the trees, the grass. And it's this pendulum, the trees grow, they get cut down, new ones come, the grass gets cut, it grows again, then it gets cut again, and this pendulum swinging back and forth. And what I did here on this slide is I just chose nine aspects, and I'm going to speak about nine, I'm not speaking about each one altogether. I chose nine aspects that I thought reflected this changing landscape. Does everybody know when the Triple SC registration opened? It opened in 2001. Does anybody know when the registration opened for managers? 2006. Practitioners? 2007. Support workers, 2008. So prior to there being a triple SC registration, what registration was there? What existed before triple SC? Did anything exist before triple SC? The SS and the SNNEB. Oh, look at my phone, Catherine. You you used to get badged, didn't you? Yes. You register with the SN yep. SNNEB which was founded in 1945. So Triple SC now have come into being, they register the sector. Anybody working in the sector now has to register with the Triple SC within six months. If you do not meet the requirement that is set upon you in terms of your job role, you then have five years to gain the qualification that you need for that job. At the moment, as of 25th of March, 2019, Registered managers was 2,597 across the whole of Scotland. 60% of those do not meet the requirement for registration. For practitioners, the number of registered staff across Scotland at the same date is 26,310. 17% have not met the requirement for registration purposes. For support workers, the registered number is 7,287 and 57% of those have not met the registration requirements. When I started in the sector in the early 1990s, only 50% of the staff legally needed to be qualified. Um, that's changed 
So there is a changing landscape in terms of the qualifications that are required. The provision has changed from, well, actually the provision is not necessarily changed, but originally care and education were separate. So the private sector and the third sector were registered more as care provision, and the local authority settings were more education. And that really had to change. So we had this idea of care versus education. So in about the late 1980s, what happened is there was this merging of the two. Um, and often people will use a phrase, I don't hear it very often anymore, called educare. That you need to blend the two together. You can't care. You can't educate without caring. The two go hand in hand. But if you look at the history of the sectors, the third and the private, along with the local authority or the public, they're very different and how historically they developed. And then they started to merge. I think Strathclyde was one of the first local authorities that actually merged and then other local authorities came along, along with it. So what I want to do is I want to, I'm just being very mindful of my time, I want to speak about two pieces of the jigsaw. One is the curriculum piece. So when do you think the first curriculum ever came into being in early learning and childcare? When did it come? Does anybody know? I guess? 60s? Mm -hmm. Nope. Any other guesses? Eight. So I've used this Cinderella picture because in academic research, if you read about the curriculum in relation to early learning and childcare, what you will come across is a service being referred to as the Cinderella service. And the reason it was referred to as the Cinderella service, because until about the 1980s, it was a service that nobody paid any attention to. Because you just play. That's all you do. You go and you play, and we're not really bothered about what's happening in your settings. And for many years, early learning and childcare lived what would be referred to as a Cinderella life. They didn't have to worry about anybody coming and trying to measure what they were doing or look at the outcomes or the provision that you were providing. It was nationally known, children learn best through play and that's what you're doing. In about the 1980s, everything changed because suddenly we entered a world of marketization and people wanted value for money. So nursery education could never, or early learning and childcare, could never live under that guise of, no, we just play. They had to prove their worth. Now, they didn't want to prove their worth with a curriculum document because that completely undermined what they were trying to do, which was to learn through play. If we have a curriculum document, then what that means is that we're formal and structured, and we don't want that. So what every single local authority did across the whole of Scotland they fought very hard to prevent what we'd called a top-down pressure from primary school, 5 to 14. The 5 to 14 curriculum was pushing down on early learning and childcare in terms of the quality of the provision that they were providing. So what you find is the first curriculums in early learning and childcare come about. That's Highlands, Strathclyde, Central, Fife. Lothian, Dumfries and Galloway. Even the private sector got onto it. There's the Burrell Collection. Massive private sector nursery in Edinburgh. I don't know if they still exist, but they were major private provision in um, Edinburgh at the time that I was looking at this. Even the Gallic provision came on board. These are all curriculum documents that were published in the 1990s as a way of preventing top-down pressure from the 5 to 14 curriculum, and a way of preventing this idea of formal curriculum. They wanted what was referred to as a process-based curriculum that used play as the vehicle for learning. And the way that they felt that they could defend that was then to produce their own curriculum documents as a way of saying, this is what we're doing, and this is why we're doing it. Because it was no longer acceptable to just verbally say, we, we learn through play. 
They needed to start to defend the practice that they were involved in. Even high school, if anybody knows anything about high school, even came up with a curriculum document. The sector were not happy in any way for producing these documents because they saw it as formalizing what they wanted as quite a flexible way of, produce, of, of presenting learning to the young children that they were working with. Now you can imagine that this wasn't enough because how can nationally we ensure that we are providing the best provision for our young children when every local authority has their own curriculum document across the whole of Scotland. So what happened in the mid-1990s is the Scottish government came on board and produced a national curriculum document, 1997. This is the first national curriculum document that was produced in Scotland, and this was for children four to five only. Now, if you were a private provider or a third sector provider that, when the vouchers disappeared, you then became partnership providers, you had to show that you implemented this curriculum. And what happened is that in Edinburgh, at that time that I was working and living, they um, employed peripatetic teachers who went round the third sector in private nurseries um, to ensure that the education was delivered in line with this curriculum document. And I remember providing training to the nursery staff or the early learning and childcare staff that were involved in this from the private sector and the third sector, and I can't even begin to tell you what they said about the teachers that came into their settings. Because the way the teachers took their job was that I'm here and I'm here only for four to five year olds. And if you're a four to five year old, I'll watch you, but if you're not, I'm, not, I'm ignoring you. Because I'm not here for this. I'm here just to watch you. That's what happened in early learning and child care. And this is around the mid-1990s, end of 1990s. This was happening. Now, it wasn't enough. Very quickly, they realized four to five is not enough. So the three to five came in. Same so sort of principles. Again, if you are a third sector or a private sector organization to be able to implement this, you had to meet the standard that was required of you. Um, and the same sort of principles work in those partnership centers that teachers would go in on a peripatetic basis. When this came in and I was still going into schools and visiting, I remember the nursery staff saying to me, we don't even know what to do with three-year-olds. What on earth are we gonna do with these three-year-olds? We've only ever worked with 45 year olds And I remember the one story that one said to me was, what if they put their hands in the fishbowl? They just couldn't even imagine that this would be something that they'd have to deal with. Now remember, I'm speaking predominantly about local authority settings, because the private setting and the third sector settings had always dealt with children who were under three. Um, so this had the biggest impact from my experience and my journey on the local authorities, because suddenly they had to take three to five year olds. Now I'm not at the chalk face now of early learning and childcare in terms of provision, but I can imagine having to take two-year-olds is even causing more discussion in the early learning and childcare settings in terms of what they would be getting up to. Now, it, it wasn't sufficient for there to be, uh, and obviously we have the pre-birth to, the pre to three as well, but it wasn't sufficient and not necessarily good practice to have the three to 18, sorry, the 5 to 14 and this early learning and childcare curriculum. And you'll all now know the story of what ended up happening. The 5 to 14 got scrapped. They never agreed with it anyway. The teachers striked because of it. In the 1980s, I was in school at that time. Teachers absolutely hated the 5 to 14. It was a very top down curriculum. So again, lots of consultation that went out. And this is where we get to where we are now, which is with the curriculum for excellence. And the curriculum for excellence that then covers and spans from three to 18. So there's this idea of a holistic process for children to go through from nursery all the way up to um, academy. Now I am aware of time, so the one thing that I want to say, and I have here this kind of policy guidelines theory into practice. What I would like to suggest to you, again, to get you to think, the curriculum for excellence was an all-inspiring idea. 
It was an awe-inspiring document, particularly for early learning and childcare, because it promoted active learning through play. It, it explicitly promoted that. And when you read the document, that's what you get. You get that sense. And I remember reading it thinking, yes, this is what we want. This is what we need. And not only do we need it in early learning and childcare, which really should go from not to eight anyway, we need it into the primary schools. This active learning through play cannot just happen in early learning and childcare with three to fives. We need to see it. Oh, in fact, we need to see it all the way up. Even I think about it in my own learning with adults. Play. Start with the child. The teacher is the best child. The teacher inside the children, they can help you. It's never fulfilled its potential. Now I'm going to be a bit controversial here. I don't think it's fulfilled its potential. And the reason why I don't think it's fulfilled its potential is because the way it's being translated into practice. So the Curriculum for Excellence promotes active learning play. It promotes these wonderful ways of working with young children. But what I've seen and heard is it's an outcome-based document. So what happens, and you can understand why it happens, is that the focus for early learning and childcare, and maybe <coughs> even further up, is that we're focusing on the output, the outcomes. You know, um, they spoke when Emma um, spoke, and I'm forgetting who was speaking with Emma. My gosh, she's one of my students. Cat. <laughs> When Emma and Kat were speaking, Kat spoke about the extended hours giving more time to, to deliver the curriculum. That's, that isn't what should be happening in early learning and childcare. We shouldn't be feeling under pressure to deliver this, this outcome-based document. You know, it, we should have plenty of space and time to allow our children to grow and to develop. So for me, um, and I remember being at it with Kathleen, and I remember walking away thinking, I, I can't be involved in early learning and childcare anymore because this to me was a play-based document. But when I speak to all these practitioners, I don't know if you remember me being there, I went away thinking, I just had it, I have to walk away. It was like nothing had changed. It's like we were still based on this outcome. They were ticking boxes in terms of what they were seeing the children doing. And I was like, why, why are we still fighting for a play-based curriculum? And we've known for years that this is where we should be. So what is often suggested in Scotland is if as an outsider you look in to the world of early learning and childcare and you read our policies and you look at our guidelines, we're world leading. We are world leading in terms of what we suggest the provision should be. Something seems to happen when this policy document theory is translated into practice. Something's lost. And I'm not suggesting that every single early learning and childcare provision isn't promoting high quality experiences, but there's something wrong with the translation into practice. So I remember being at Cal's conference last year, and I can't remember who it was that stood up and spoke about it, but he clearly said, in policy we're world leading, in practice we're not in any shape or form. Um, and that's quite interesting to actually have that kind of understanding. So for me, we need to go back to the basics and really understand if we want to provide high early learning and childcare, we have to stop this attitude of ticking boxes. For what purpose? It's not for the purposes of the children. It's the purposes to prove that we're doing our job and we're doing our job well. Because if we tick all the boxes, then that's a way of measuring our success. Remember, I didn't say these were all my points of view. I'm just being antagonistic because I'm being the academic here. <laughs> OK. And I've used up my time. Quick. <laughs> OK. Really, uh, this is the next piece of the jigsaw. I, and. You can see that what I've tried to do is here are all SQA, Scottish Qualifications Authority. These are all SQA approved qualifications. Here are university approved qualifications. And here 
um, are SDS, Scot Skills Development Scotland. So we've kind of got a divide between who approves the different qualifications that are now recognised by Triple SC. So Triple SC are the registering body, and essentially, unless they recognise your qualification, you cannot um, meet the requirements for that job. So if you don't have some of these qualifications here, which are predominantly for practitioner level, these ones aren't, um, then you would be required to do them. What I would like to say in just tying things up is I think I've seen in the years that I've been program leader for BHLG practice that the sector itself is pushing to be degree qualified. I see that all the time because I see the students who are applying for BHLG practice are younger students. They're aspiring to be leaders in the sector. And they may not even want to be a manager, but they want to do more for the children and the families that they are working with. If the sector is aspiring to be degree qualified, the terms and conditions and professionalization of the sector has to change. It has to pay in line with other professions. If we're promoting early learning and childcare as being so fundamentally important, which I believe it is, then we have to remunerate the staff in line with that value that we're giving. Because essentially by the time a child is five, all of the brain connections have predominantly developed that lay the foundation for the rest of their lives. So anybody working in early learning and childcare has to realize that they're making the biggest contribution to that child's life. Because if you don't get the foundations right, the skyscraper will fall. And basically, that's what you need to think about in early learning and childcare. Now, I know Jennifer, you said I'd speak about the GA. I'll say one more thing. I'll say one thing about the GA before I just show you the final slide. The <coughs> graduate apprenticeship is a completely new degree level qualification that has been introduced by the government. There's only 30 pilot places across the whole of Scotland. 15 of those are at the University of Highlands and Islands. It's only a pilot, we don't know if it will run past the pilot. But my aspiration for that qualification is that it will be the degree that is recognized by SSC for the sector. That that would be the degree for those that aspire to be degree qualified to do. Because BHL to practice was developed and its aim and purpose was for managers and lead practitioners. Although I think there needs to be a major distinction made between what a lead practitioner is compared to a manager. I actually think they're very different. And I think the GA and early learning and childcare is what should be promoted for lead practitioners. And you therefore then have a career ladder that is support worker, practitioner, lead practitioner, manager. And that there is a career progression, which I know there is in many local authorities, as well as a pay progression that is above the living wage. Way above the living wage. And my final slide, what I want to share with you, is this notion of early learning and childcare um, that we must fight very, very hard not to schoolify early learning and childcare. So we have a three to 18 curriculum. There's this idea of fluidity all the way through the different years of the school. But what we still see sometimes in early learning and childcare is the, the, the pressure to test and prepare for school. This is Emma's story. And you can see here what I've done is I've highlighted specific things that Emma can do skills that she's able to achieve. Now, I'm not necessarily saying she should be able to do these all by the time she leaves uh, early learning and childcare at the age of five, but what I'm trying to suggest to you is if we focus on an outcome-based process of skills, then what you're doing is you're missing the whole point of early learning and childcare. And that we should never focus on mastering skills first. 